Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Intentional Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Campion, and I am delighted to bring you this conversation today with Todd Herman. If you don't know Todd, he is a world-renowned mental performance coach and mentor to everyone from Olympic athletes and pro sports stars to CEOs and entrepreneurs. Todd is also the author of The Alter Ego Effect, a groundbreaking book on the power of creating alter egos to help us optimize our performance from the boardroom to the playing field. I am psyched for you to hear this conversation. Todd shares with me some real gems uh, from his experience in the coaching world and his experience in building businesses. We also got pretty deep into a discussion around alter egos and just how powerful they can really be. Todd was also kind enough to help me start building one on the fly, so you'll have to listen through to hear how that one went. Um, Before we get started, I've got two requests for you. Uh, Number one, if you'd like to receive one email from me every other week with practical, actionable tips on improving things like habits and routines and even motivation, head over to gregcampion.substack.com and subscribe. It's where I'm sharing all of the insights I'm learning from people like Todd, including my own episode recaps. So check that out. And secondly, uh, if you like this episode and you're enjoying the Intentional Wisdom podcast, please help me spread the word. We've gotten some amazing feedback on some of our episodes recently, which has been super cool to see. So thank you all for that. Um, But people really only hear about this podcast through word of mouth. So please get on social media, uh, share the episode, help us uh, with our mission to improve lives. That's really what we're trying to do with these conversations. All right. Enough intro for me. Here is Todd Herman. All right, Todd Herman. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm psyched, psyched to have you here. Um, uh, I've been a fan of yours for for some time. Um, been really enjoying your content that you've been putting out for for a few years now. Um, and uh, I think it was a couple of years ago when I first took my first tour through your book, uh, The Alter Ego Effect. And then uh, ahead of this conversation, I had the pleasure of uh, going through it again. Um, this time, audio version. So you mm-hmm. accompanied me on a few. Long, slow zone two runs, which I'm very into right now. So uh, nice. believe it or not, your voice was traveling around the roads of North Carolina uh, recently. So. <laughs> that that audio book, um, oddly enough, has actually, it's, it's, it's a bit of an enigma in the publishing world in that it's, uh, it's the only book, it's the only audio book that's outsold the actual hardcover book by a factor of three to one plus. Wow. Um, but that's also because I've done... Oh, I think I'm up to like 289 podcast interviews on it. So, you wow. know, audio files will listen to audio books yep. and, um, anyways. Yeah. So I've been on a lot sense. of different people's travels. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's awesome. No, I, and I, and I love books that are, uh, narrated by the authors themselves. So I appreciate it that you took the time to, uh, to do that. Yeah. Hopefully all those yeah. podcasts have been a good practice for you honing, honing that craft as well. It has. Um, okay. Well, for our listeners who may not be as familiar with you, so you're, of course, an author. Uh, you are a coach, which I want to talk about. You're an entrepreneur, and I'm sure you have many other roles in your life, dad, husband, and I'm sure many that I don't even know about. So, yeah. um, but, but let's maybe start with the coaching. Um, I'd love to hear about just that business and what you do, who you coach, and you know what you help what you help them with. Maybe let's start there. Yeah, sure. So, um, well, first thing is I started coaching in 1997 before this was even an industry. Um, you know, there's a handful of us that kind of were the icebreakers, so to speak. So I've been in it for now, the end of this year will be my 20, going into my 27th year doing it. And, um, back then it was dedicated wholly and fully to just coaching. Now I run, you know, different, training and coaching companies. So my time is spent being CEO and then the coaching clients that I do have either fall into one of two groups. One is uh, mentoring group slash cohort type um, uh, groups that come in. Most of those people are going to be in the entrepreneurial or CEO um, range that are kind of going through the phase of growing their businesses. And any time entrepreneurship is such a challenging thing because you're always having to shed your identity to get into another role that you need to take a hold of. Mm-hmm. Like, say, for example, you know, when you start out, you're a founder 
and that's very much a founder identity is you got to be scrappy. You got to hustle. You got to know, like, you got to keep on trying to work it out. And it's like a mad scientist in the lab. And then after that, if you maintain that identity while you're um, now scaling or building the business, you've got the wrong identity that's going to make the business fail because the next identity you need is a stabilizer identity. And that's actually the, the CEO type thing. And so me being alter ego guy and, you know, kind of a global expert on identity for the last like 20, 20 plus years. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the unique way and reason that people come to me is, yeah, I need to grow the business and I like your frameworks and the way that you guys do things. But I also want to make sure that I'm not the thing that gets in its way, which is yeah. oftentimes the challenge. So then on the one-on-one -on -one type of mentoring, which I only basically would work with about six people at any one time, um, because in my view, if you're in the coaching space and even training, or you're a creator or a course creator, or whatever, if you don't maintain some sort of one le one on one level of um, consulting, coaching, or mentoring, you're getting yourself off the field of play, is what I say, and you're now losing the nuance. So mm -hmm. if if you do that for a year, that's fine. But two, three, four years, you're now out of touch. Um, yeah. And so that's one of the frameworks I give people in the actual consumer side is when you're interviewing a coach or even someone creating programming, find out if that person still does one-on-one -on -one coaching, if they're the person who's creating the content, because if they don't, or if they're not doing agency type work, then the, the quality and the value that you would ever get out of their programming would be pretty low. I'm not saying you can't get value, but only the practitioners that are on the field of play day in, day out, week in, week out are, are the ones who are the holders of wisdom. That's just, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. people can argue with me all they want on it, but um, results show for it. So yeah, basically same level of promise. It's just taken into a one-on-one a -on -one level. And, and then on the one-on-one -on -one side of things, the only thing that's different is I still do mentoring coach professional and Olympic athletes. Um, that still come away, even though I sold that training and coaching company to Real Madrid back in 2014. Um, hmm. You know, I've been in that world for 26 years and I've got a huge brand in the kind of professional ranks. So mm -hmm. there's still a lot of word of mouth that comes back my way and people wanting to work with me. And plus the book just does that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. So many different directions we can go on the back of that, Todd. Uh, well, I'll ask you this too, like Greg, like when, yeah. when to, to the person who's listening to this, where mm. are they kind of in their journey as well? Um, I know you had sent me through some stuff too, but kind of straight from the horse's mouth, because I can, I can zero in on that because I've been through all those journeys and I still mentor people as well. I mean, coaching is my favorite thing in the world. I'll never stop up on my, on my last day. If you were to do an itinerary of what happened to Todd on his last day, coaching would have been one of the things I did on my last day on the planet. I'll now, never what is it? What is it that's so fulfilling about coaching to you? Well, I mean, coaching for one thing is oftentimes it's the last stop on someone's journey to try to overcome something, to build a skill in something, to develop um, because... If you think of the average journey of someone who becomes interested in either figuring out a problem that they have or developing a skill um, or completing a project. So they become first aware that they have this want, desire, or pain point. And then they go on this journey of learning more about it. Okay, so that could be Google searches, that could be watching YouTube videos, that could be reading articles, picking up a book, et cetera. So there's all these different milestones are going through. Now, some people could solve it from any one of those pieces of content. Mm -hmm. Many don't though. And then they go and they might even consume a course. They might travel to a workshop. They might go to an event, like all these other forms. And yet still someone might feel like they're missing the nuance of it, or it's not quite working for them. And why is that? And kind of their final step on that process is typically going to be a coach, some sort of one-on-one -on -one or maybe even group or cohort type thing. And I, I take that very seriously because I know now the pain journey that someone has gone through and has been experiencing for insert X amount of time 
Mm. And for someone to now place their faith and trust in me or my coaching and training companies, like I take that seriously and I, and I enjoy playing that role because I come at my world with what I call like the heart of a coach. There's a lot of people who call themselves coaches, but they're not really coaches. They don't have a heart of a coach because the heart of a coach is there's a lot of factors that go into it, but you very much love the service delivery process. Like yeah. Yeah. You, you love that trying to figure out the little dials that make someone work and you're spinning it back and forth until finally it unlocks. And I, and it's, that's, I, I say it that way because it's that moment that I'm always looking for yeah. that moment yeah. in time where I can see it in the person that I'm looking at. If it's face to face, if it's on a zoom call or whatever the case is, you can literally see the physical shift in someone and mm. that is, it's unbeatable. You just can't beat it. And then, whether that's in business or, you know, like I coach my kids in their sports teams and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that like when you see someone get it and the stress white wash away or the anxiety or, you know, some sort of internal narrative that they were telling about what, whether or not they could or couldn't do something um, or the, you know, just the, the stress of I've been trying to work this out for so long and that one thing is what helped me. Like, I mean, we all have our addictions. Mine just happens to be a very healthy one that's directed towards, <laughs> you know, helping someone transform. But, yeah. you know, and I, I take that seriously. I take the honor of that very seriously. Um, I love it and um, I'll never stop doing it. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, I love that. Uh, and I can imagine how rewarding that is, really. I mean, it's uh, a lot of people, you know, go to their jobs every day and, you know, maybe they're part of a company and they have a certain thing that they're responsible for and they do it and, you know, they're connected and they kind of understand what the ultimate meaning and purpose is behind it and why it's important. But I think for you, uh, what you get to do for a living every day is, yeah, what you just described. It's like really, you know, legitimately having positive impacts on people's lives. So I can, I can see why, how you could get addicted to that. Yeah. Um, and for me, like I, I've thought a lot about purpose and, uh, you know, things like why, you know, high level in my own life, like about purpose and that where I ultimately landed on was, um, you know, my purpose is to serve others and basically use the, the resources that I have, my time, et cetera, to serve others in, in various parts of life. Um, but for you and what you do every day, I feel like that's a very like clear, direct connection, which is really cool um, and rewarding, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, I, one of the frames that I give people actually for how they're should be growing their, in this case, we could say a coaching business or a training or an expert business, thought leader business, whatever is when you're starting out, you want to make sure that the activities that you're doing, if you're, if you're in a, if you need to generate revenue and sales or even validate this, that this thing is even going to work out there in the marketplace is you want to be as close to green light activities as you possibly can in, in relation to the act of being on the field and getting money, right? Like, so if you're not actively constantly putting an offer in front of a prospective client every single day, and instead you're like, you know, I'm going to work on my brand. A brand is a red light activity. Yep. I'm not saying that that activity isn't important, but there are, in my work with dealing with elite human beings on the planet, the most elite are very good at knowing exactly what moves the needle on their mm. personal performance, whether it's an athlete or it's an entrepreneur or a CEO or a public figure, yep. whatever the case is. And I would say that many people who struggle disillusion themselves by convincing themselves that the activity that they're doing is really important. They justify it, but- in reality, on the scoreboard, it doesn't actually help them right now. Yeah. So I say that because I look at green light activities in the way that Todd Herman has built. And we all have them. Like we all have activities that like, so when I think about the green light activities, not in the metric side of things of like numbers, but in the stuff that lights me up at my core, coaching is a green light activity. When I look on my calendar and I don't see much coaching happening in my week, yeah. Um, and again, that might be designed because maybe I'm in a one week sprint because we're putting together a, a training thing 
I will engineer a way in my week to just call a couple of friends in my downtime just to catch up with them. That's the kind of frame. But I know I'll be giving back to them in some way because if I don't do those activities, I am not filling up my week with green light activities that light me up. So you can call it soul level or at the heart level or whatever. And, um, and that's one of the things I go back to when it comes to like the heart of a coach, like, um, you love coaching, like you love doing that. Like a real coach loves it. Hmm. I got to get myself on this list of people that you call when you're bored or you're not, you're not happy with your activities that we get some free well, coaching. Like, I mean, I do the same thing. Like, I mean, I, we've got clients that are in say like leveraged programs that we have. And, um, we were talking right before we got on about, um, you know, living in New York city and you live there and we have our home there and I've been there since 2006. Um, but we just bought a place you know, back in Canada. And so we're in the mountains and we split our time and stuff. And um, uh, every single thing that's helped to grow my business, and this is very applicable to everyone that's listening to this, this isn't some sort of story book, but a lot of people think about building leverage and automation into their business far sooner than they need to. And one of the things that we're famous for, it's actually a meme online, um, mm -hmm. is when someone orders something from us, we have a rule that we try to call you within 15 minutes of ordering. Wow. And most of the time, I'm the one who actually does the phone call. So I have a folder that mm -hmm. goes into my inbox. And if I'm available um, and I'm going into my inbox at predetermined times in the day and I see that there's you know, orders in there, I'll go and look in that folder and then you know, the number, phone number's there and I'll just call. And there's wow, many, cool. many reasons why we do that. One is... I love talking to people. And mm -hmm. so one, it's just how I'm built. Two, nobody calls anybody from an online order. And so mm -hmm. when I first started doing that, I had, I'll never forget a guy in Montreal. He had been running online businesses since like 1998 or 99. And he said, uh, when, he, when I called him, he's like, I can't believe you're calling me. I have bought stuff from everybody online and no one has ever made a phone call to me he's like you've got a customer for life and wow. i was like well i appreciate that but you know um i'm i'm calling to find out like you know where were you at that caused you to hit the buy button right now so this is the second first part is it's just a good brand experience right so someone goes oh my god todd or his company calls and actually says thanks yeah yep. Um, because I do, that's part of my, you know, I say to everybody, you know, thank you for playing your faith. Thank you for placing your faith and trust in us. I know how big of a leap it can be online at times because, you know, there's a lot of promises made, but are they actually following through? Yeah. And, um, and then I said, and then the secondary part of that is I want to find out where was someone at right before they purchased, because I don't like inventing marketing. I don't think I'm very good at marketing. However, my company is very good at marketing. And the reason is because we've engineered a process that leverages who I am. And then we just simply take this content of me calling Greg and then me finding out like, where were you when you ordered? Um, and that's Basically actually- Basically writes your, write your new landing page for you. Whatever my pain points were, or is your new landing page copy? And you know what everyone gives you? A story. Mm. And the stories I get from people are real. They're resonant. Um, they're not made up. I can't make up some of the stories. One of the reasons why a lady purchased from us in the past, um, it was for one of our big um, cohort campaigns that we were doing for our 90 day year company, um, which is like a sports performance approach to growing and scaling a business. That's it. We have this performance system. And um, so she signed up. And when I called her, it was about eight minutes after she had ordered. And after her saying, I can't believe like, this is amazing. I was just watching a video of you. And now you're on the phone with me. And so is anybody creeped out by the way? Is anybody creeped out by this approach? No, no one ever no, is. Okay. Okay. No, no one's okay, ever been creeped yeah. out. No one ever is. So if someone has that psychology, They're just shocked, their head, right? yeah. it rates it right away. Cause it's immediately what happens nowadays is people go straight to Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn or Instagram yeah. or whatever. And they're like Todd Herman or 90 day year, uh, people, or, you know, Greg just called, you know, I can't believe it. And I just had such a great conversation with them or, or whatever they say. So I called her and she runs a million dollar plus a year e-commerce business in the knitting and sewing space. Okay. Hmm. Um, and I was like, wow, good for you. Like, 
that that's what an amazing accomplishment for to be able to achieve million dollar plus revenue level um, in what would typically be um, a low dollar category, right? Because she's not selling ten thousand dollar programming mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. something like that. So I said, "What was going on in your world though that caused you to uh, join our program?" And she's like, "I'll tell you exactly what was going on. I just came home from." the grocery store and I put all the groceries away. And then I went into my office and I record five to seven minute pattern videos. So top down camera over top of my desk and I'm walking through the pattern for my community. And um, about the six minute mark, and it takes me a while to set it all up and you know even get in my headspace. About the six minute mark, my daughter comes barging in and says, hey mom, where are the Cheerios? And she's like, and excuse my language here, but this is exactly what she said. She's like, no, Todd, I don't know about you, but I don't fucking hide the Cheerios in my house. <laughs> like, I don't know if you do that either. Uh, <laughs> but they're in the exact same spot they always are in the pantry. Yeah. And she's like, that's why. Because I actually have built a million dollar plus business, retired my husband from, mm-hmm. um, he worked at a um, uh, motor company uh, plant. And he does the bookkeeping now in the business. She's like, he works four hours a week and golfs 16 hours. Like he golfs like four times a week. Um, and we have this amazing life. And yet I still do not get the respect of my family of having, of building a business to a million dollar plus. I'm just hmm. a mom who buys the Cheerios. Hmm. So kind of end scene on that. And immediately when she was telling me the story, I'm like, oh my God, she just gave me the best subject line for an email. And so our, Highest producing subject line for our 90 day year campaign that we have is in quotes, Hey mom, where are the Cheerios? End quote. Can you relate? That's a good hook. And then I tell the story of this phone call that I make and um, we get so many email replies back from that, especially from women entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. saying, Mm -hmm. you literally just described my life. I'm sure. And so part of the process of marketing, there's this great marketing book called the Robert Collier Letter Book that was written in about 1959, I think it was. But the biggest takeaway, you don't have to go read the book, but the biggest takeaway of that is he's the one who coined the phrase, enter the conversation going on in the mind of your customer. So many of us try to invent the conversation. That's how you know you've got good stuff is when people are responding and replying back to it. So, Mm. you know, this hundreds and now thousands of people that have replied back to that email saying, oh my God, you literally just described my life. That is me entering the conversation or us inventing and entering the conversation going in the mind of that client or customer. They just might not have been thinking about it that day. Mm. And so now going and thinking through 3% of, you know, this is a very common framework, about 3% of the population is actively seeking out a problem to, or a solution to a problem they have right now. Okay. So today I bought a new um, monitor for my office, right? Mm -hmm. If I would have seen an ad for, hey, this is the best monitor to buy for your home office setup, I'd have been a very easy purchaser, right? But I went and did my research and I I bought it. Um, So that's 3% of the population. A larger percent of the population though are people who've got a mild pain point, but it's not a searing pain right now. So me telling that story, which is a true story, took people that were in that kind of interested level immediately into, let me solve this. Because if she went and bought it and she's got the same story, like this all happens at the subconscious level in in, in people's heads. Um, Now you've got, you're able to convert better. Now I want to round this out for you so that people don't think we went down a rabbit hole that isn't applicable. This is why coaches have the superpower over everybody else because you are actively participating on the field of play every single day. Your messaging can be a million times stronger than everyone else because you've got the true story. And if you don't find a way as a coach to tell those stories, translate those case studies well, you're actually keeping yourself smaller at making an impact than you can if you learn that skill. Um, and so no one, people who don't 
call people, talk to people individually, one-on-one, they'll never get that story of, hey, mom, where are the Cheerios? You'll never, you can't invent that stuff. I love it. Love it. All right. Well, that was a free, a free uh, lesson in uh, marketing. And I've got, I've got way more, Greg. What, what else you got? <laughs> what else you got? <laughs> I love it. And it's also, and I think, you know, I like the way you brought it home too, because I think, um, you know, I, I it's funny. I, I've, I've not hired a executive coach or a personal coach or wh- how, however you want to call it. And, and I, I take your point from earlier. I think there is like just such a vast spectrum of people who call themselves coaches. Um, but I've had some great conversations with people on this podcast. Um, one stands out in my head right now, a um, guy by the name of Jesse Puji, who uh, is a really successful um, tech uh, entrepreneur, um, started multiple businesses and sold them. And he's got a really big presence on Twitter and other places um, today. But he was talking to me about just the uh, incredible impact that working with a coach. I think his coach worked in something called the conscious leadership um, framework mm-hmm. and uh, so we, we got into a big discussion on that, but anyway, some of these conversations with Jesse, with you are slowly getting me down this funnel of Greg, you probably need a coach, but, um, so, whether it's, whether it's a coach, I am a product yeah. of standing on the tops and the shoulders of giants. The best yeah. advice I ever got was from my parents when I was leaving our family's ranch. Like they knew that I was going to be the, the son that never came back to take over you know, anything. My, one of my older brothers went and, uh, took over the farm and ranch and has since like grown it even larger than my dad did, which was already huge at the time. And, um, so they said, you know, like, hopefully we've prepared you for life well with like character and integrity, like the stuff that, you know, (laughs) it's really hard to find it out there on your own. Um, And they said, but whatever you go and decide to do, find whoever is the best yeah. Settle for anything but the best and tuck yourself under their wing. And, yeah. um, and some of that advice looking back was because one, they knew that I wasn't a humble kid at the time. You know, I had a very big and strong ego. I could do anything. Like there was a lot of confidence that was there and brashness and, you know, yeah. thank God it was in many ways because it's that ignorance that helped me to launch certain things at a young age. Um, And, but the humility that I was going to need so that I didn't try to do everything so hard on my own. That's what people really don't appreciate about great coaches that are at the top of the game or great mentors at the top of the game. A lot of times people are looking at it very binary. How much does this person cost and how much does this person cost? Oh, they're cheaper. Mm -hmm. But with me, say for example, um, or not even me. Um, going back to my one of my first mentors, Harvey Dorfman, who's known as the Yoda of baseball, wrote the Bible of the industry called Coaching the Mental Game, which is where I started. Mm. And, um, you know, big, huge name in Major League Baseball. And I cold outreached to him and managed to talk my way into coming and spending some time with him in North Carolina, where he was during the baseball offseason. And on the eighth day of being with him, one of the absolute legends of the game came down for his annual pilgrimage to spend a day with him um, because he wasn't under contract yet from any major league baseball team. So he used um, the November, December, January sort of time frame to work with individuals in the sport. And then he would get locked into a team at that time. It was the San Diego Padres. And he would go and then, because when he, when he's working the Padres, he can't work with some young guy who's a, mm. you know, pitcher for the New York Yankees, right? Conflict of interest. So, here I am, the legend comes in on the eighth day and he says, Todd, do you want to sit on the session? I okayed it with him. So I was like, yeah. So I get to watch the Yoda of baseball, the, the greatest mental game coach to arguably ever live. I'm always trying to live up to Harvey. Working with, at the time, the greatest pitcher in Major League Baseball. And do you think that that helped to shatter a whole bunch of my misconceptions or my own assumptions about what it, what you were going to talk about with an athlete, I realized 80% of the content of their conversations was actually life coaching stuff. It was Mm. Harvey trying to manage the off the field stuff that was distracting this athlete from getting out on the field. 
Now, if you only managed the on the field stuff, you would be missing out on the 80% that's actually impacting the performance. So after that, I was with him for 33 days. Then Harvey started sending me clients. He opened up doors. That's how I actually got into wow. really working oh, with professional really cool. athletes at a high level because he had a small practice. He didn't want to grow things. And so people would reach out. I can't work with you. I'm with the Padres or I have no capacity, but there's a young guy that I'm working with. And Harvey would say, and he's better than me. And of course he needs to say that because no one wants chopped liver, <laughs> you know, which is kind of what I was, I think, in comparison at the time. And, and that's what spiraled up me into the professional yeah. ranks was that. So my point about all that is to your context of hiring a coach, yep. don't forget that there are a whole series of other dominoes that are dropping into doorways and opening up windows and side doors that you could never even imagine. And that's why when my parents told me, find who's the best. Yeah. I'm sure they didn't think of it this way, but the way that that turned out for me was it got me into a class of human beings immediately and around yeah. other leaders and fantastic humans that it would have taken me decades to do on my own. Yeah. Yeah. That is a great piece of advice. And that's great for, I, I love that advice, probably appropriate at any time in life, but, but certainly for um, yeah. young people, you know, choosing a career path, where to work, all that kind of stuff where I've got, uh, my oldest is 11 years old. So we're a few years into the future. We'll be, we'll be thinking about all that kind of stuff probably sooner than we think, but, yeah. um, I love that. So you mentioned, uh, well, I mentioned, um, I mentioned your book, The Alter Ego Effect, uh, at the top of this conversation. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. If anyone has not read the book or heard you discuss it in other places, I'd love to shine a light on that. So, um, you know, in the book, you you talk about, well, that you explained it, but you, you describe the stories of many different people from professional sports to entertainers, people like Bo Jackson to Beyonce, mm -hmm. who unbeknownst to probably most of the population have used this uh, alter ego tactic, whether or not they knew it by that name or not, but they yeah. use a tactic of creating another identity for themselves uh, to help them with their own performance. So I'd love to hear you just talk about the idea um, at a high level, because then I'd like to dive into that and try to demystify this for people and help sure. them to understand how can I potentially look to implement this in my own life, in my kids' yeah. own lives, uh, et cetera. So um, start there wherever you think is appropriate. Yeah. Well, I mean, the term alter ego was first coined by Cicero back in 44 BC when he was writing it in a letter to a, a, a friend who had asked him about his kind of secrets to success. Because again, he was like one of the greatest Roman statesmen and philosophers to ever live. And um, he coined the term alter ego. And in his description, it means the other I or trusted friend within. And we all know, we just got to talk about the power of mentors you know, in our, in our world. But many people within the six inches of their own ears inside of that internal world, um, they sort of do battle on their own let's say, and they don't have sources of inspiration to help them, you know, level up, um, get to a, a, a new uh, crossing of a chasm of their own identity. And, and so in its short form, you know, even the sub headline on the book says the power of secret identities to transform your life. Um, what I really wanted to add in there was the counterintuitive way. Because mm. people think alter ego, is that me being fake? Is that, you know, being inauthentic mm -hmm. or something like that? And it's yep. the exact opposite, actually. Because the alter ego is a creation of your own from the source code of a need, a desire, and a want to go and pursue something that for whatever reason, you have a hard time seeing this current version and story of who you are do it. The alter ego is you tapping into your creative imagination to come up with a creative way to get past that resistance within. And the resistance within is very difficult to beat with logic. Very difficult. You know, you try to meet the resistance within head on, it will win 99% of the time. And again, this isn't a statistical, like it's not, but you know, in my, you know, experience, it's hard. But the creative imagination seems to be the ultimate weapon to beat resistance within. Mm. It's it's like the stealth fighter that goes around it and sneaks around it. And the alter ego was the ultimate sneak to get into the back door of personal performance. 
And so many people did it intuitively. You talked about Beyonce, Sasha Fierce, even um, Eminem, the alter ego. David Bowie, probably the greatest practitioner of alter egos of all time. He would always invent a brand new alter ego for a new album to try and tap into a new expressive side of himself because he never wanted mm -hmm. to be kind of typecast as a certain type. Um, uh, Martin Luther King, I share the story of him in the book. No one even knows this. In fact, um, it was in a private conversation with his wife after I did a speech in 2004 where she approached me when I talked about alter egos and she shared the story of um, how Martin used an alter ego, which he called the distinguished self to go into his writing room to write his speeches. And he would put on a pair of non-prescription fake glasses, um, which I have shared this story with even friends of his who knew him at the time, mm -hmm. uh, George Raveling being one who's one of the ambassadors of the, uh, the Nike brand, um, famous in the world of basketball. And he was like, wait, I thought he needed those as reading glasses. And I was like, <laughs> no, he, he activated the distinguished self to, in the words of Coretta, to carry a mission that was so important that he did not want to, and his ego get in the way of its mm. kind of pure source. And the people who have become legendary with their alter egos, that's actually one of the frames. That's why in the book, there's a chapter called The Mission. Um, and you know, you had talked earlier about kind of your purpose in life and, and many things. And I would say it's one of the great pitfalls of doing personal development and self-leadership work is trying to come up with an overarching purpose for your life. That's very hard mm -hmm. because we have many roles and identities. It's so much easier if I said to you, hey, Greg, what's the purpose that you have as a dad? Mm -hmm. And not try and conflate it, right? Because who you are as a dad I hope is different than who you are in your business because it needs different skills. Mm -hmm. Now there's sort of core values that might operate back and forth that are very similar, but human beings, we've created this set of language that traps us. And again, that's my work is, you know, trying to find the words and the phrases and the paradigms that people operate through that are actual traps or strings that hold them back and cut them, snip them, break the frame for them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, language is one of them. So when I've said that to people on stage, now think about, you know, what's the mission that you have as a dad or purpose? Or what's the mission that you have as um, the leader in your business? What's the mission you have as a podcast host when you're interviewing people? Because that's a different set of skills than who it is that needs to show up to run and build the business, right? Mm. Um, people go, oh, that it's just, it's a focuser. So the alter ego, when people had it resonant with a deeper mission um, within became a transformative device for them to become more of what they always wanted to see themselves become, but in some ways felt difficult to allow Todd to get out there and do it. Um, yeah. But when I stepped into Super Richard, who Super Richard for me, the way that I language is, I hired Super Richard to be the advocate for Todd's stuff. And this is resonant for coaches. Everyone says coaching or you know, training is such an easy business to get into because there's no cost of goods sold. You're not ordering things from someplace and it's going through a manufacturing process and then mm. shipping it and all that. And while that's true, that makes that business more challenging. What makes this business very challenging is many people's frame is I'm going out and selling myself. And that's hard for many people to do. That is a huge chasm for a lot of people mm -hmm. to struggle with. I did. I was, when I started out, a good coach. I didn't have all the skills yet, but I had the one thing I recognized that I had that allowed me to compete with people who were actually a lot better than me was I outcared everyone else. I loved working with young team athletes. I was making nothing. 75 bucks for a package of three sessions. That's what I started with in 1997. Mm -hmm. And that's what I kept on selling until the end of 1999. That was how much you could get me for. 25 bucks for a session and it was an hour long session and it was in-home visits in wow. the, um, the city That's of Edmonton. Steal. That and, is definitely a steal. Well, I don't know if it was or not. Um, it gave me many things, which was because uh, I was so cheap, it gave me reps. Yes. So it gave me a lot of coaching hours. Yeah, gave me a lot of clients. 
And then I could, it helped me develop better programming later on. Whereas some people are trying to price themselves so high that it mitigates the amount of people they can work with, which then also mitigates the innovation you, you could end up having in your industry. Like, look at, like I became known as Mr. Alter Ego around the world. I've got a shoe line with Brooks running. You know, there was a show that came out on Fox based around the book. You know, it typically doesn't happen to people in the coaching space, but it's because I worked with so many people one-on-one that I discovered this sort of amazing nuance of the best of the best, which is alter egos. Yeah. But I say this around advocacy. When Super Richard became the advocate for Todd's stuff, I was so insecure with going out and selling, you know, my services that my commitments I made to myself at night when I was laying on my pillow and beating myself up for not making the calls that I needed to make in order to book workshops or speeches in order to grow my business, I would say, tomorrow I'm going to do it. And then another day would end and I didn't do it. But Super Richard was custom built to make those calls. And he became the advocate for Todd's stuff. It's not that I had a crisis of my own identity. It didn't, it's not that I didn't believe in myself. I did. I just had some sort of resistance within around selling and marketing, you know, this um, new business that I had. But Super Richard didn't. Uh, and, and he cared about getting Todd out there into the world. And, and even the language I'm using right now to kind of comment on the conversation, mm -hmm. when you can turn yourself sometimes into an object within your own head, you can start to mm -hmm. detach from the difficult part of your own self-talk. And so, and in fact, there's many studies that have been done inspired from this work around when an athlete is running. So when you're out there and you're running, instead of saying, I can do this, you actually have an increase in performance when you say, Greg can do this. Greg's getting stronger. Mm. When you can objectify yourself or he can do it or she mm -hmm. can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's like you've got this cheerleader within encouraging you to keep on going. Hmm. Anyway, maybe that wasn't the shortest that. way of describing that. the alter ego stuff, but I kind of went off into a bunch of different angles there. I like the uh, I like that the last point that you're making. It almost reminds me of sort of um, meditation, generally speaking, just being at an arm's length away from your thoughts and being able to witness your yep. thoughts as opposed to being your thoughts. Um, but maybe back to so, you know, I think uh, maybe there's a perception, if you're not super familiar with this technique, maybe there's a perception that, okay, having an alter ego maybe is like disingenuous or fake or something like that. And it's kind of funny. I think back to, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure like almost everybody probably has this experience, but I think back to like being in high school, for some mm -hmm. reason, this sticks out in my mind and I'm like, yeah, like I remember being in geometry class and I was like this super quiet, reserved kid. And I think it was a function of the environment. This is the teacher. These are the kids who are in the class. I'm basically not saying a word the entire semester or whatever. Uh, two periods later, I'm in physics class and it's half of my buddies and a much more fun teacher. And I'm like life of the party, class clown yeah, type yeah, person. Yeah. And I always remember thinking like, I'm so weird. Like I am like, mul I have like multiple personalities and I'm, I'm different people in different situations. But um, like I said, I think everybody probably experiences uh, some version of this. Um, but let me, let me take it back to the mission for a second, because I thought what you were saying about Martin Luther King was really powerful. And to me, I think, the idea of um, creating an alter ego for yourself is almost like a means to an end, right? And so if you think about if there's this really powerful mission, and who had a more powerful mission than Martin Luther King, right? Sure. And if this guy can uh, create this alter ego for himself because maybe he did not feel like Martin Luther King was up for the challenge, but if he could create an alter ego who was up for the challenge, um, that's a pretty darn noble thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to, to just talk a little bit about some of those tactics and triggers to get into it. So you talk in the book about artifacts, we talk about names, 
Mm-hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that and use whatever ex- example you want to use, but some of those tactics to kind of get you from point A to point B. I know that was, a, there was a lot in that. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to yeah. react to, but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in the book, so the, the title Alter Ego Effect, which is, well, what's the effect of using Alter Ego? So I answer that, you know, in the book of, you know, how it becomes this transformative way for people to develop themselves. Um, and, and also really around speed because, you know, my clients became or came to me because I became known as what is like a quick hit guy. I could help someone transform very quickly. And that's because I just had a better tool because when you, you know, your, your attitudes, your beliefs, your behaviors, your actions, your habits are all stacked on top of the identity. So when you change the identity, all the other stuff can go and change with it a lot yeah, yeah. easier because you're, yep. you're associating your self to something different, a different narrative and a different story. And, um, and so the method that I then walk through inside the book, well, one is, you know, the first thing is define the role or the version of you that you want to go and change. Cause we're not creating a, um, an umbrella alter ego for your entire life. Cause yep. Yep. that's, that's how most people get trapped inside their identities, um, or their, you know, uh, ver- description of self. There is no self. There is no, there's no point inside of any of us that I can say, well, that's you, right? Yep. What's at our core is a whole set of uh, traits and attributes and qualities. It's just that most people flex the muscle of an identity that only brings certain things out into the world. And that's actually what people are lacking the communication style in when they're finding that there's some sort of resistance that they can't articulate to someone else. And it's because, yeah, you've got a habit of an identity, but what's in you is stuff that wants to get out, but it's being blocked by this shell and of an identity that you keep on describing yourself as. All right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, so all I'm doing is giving you one a- question on that. Do you, yeah. do you have coaching clients who you work with who have multiple alternative egos? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I do. Okay. Yeah. There's no one yeah. okay. encompassing okay. alter ego that I have. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. as I look at, so I've done, I've done some thinking and some work on identity and thinking that's kind of how I start my year is like starting with purpose and then identity. Like who am I trying to be in different yeah. parts of my life? And so like I've identified, I think six different things. I want to be a great husband, a great dad, an extremely fit man. Mm-hmm. Profitable independent creator and a, an effective executive and a skilled golfer. Okay. Yeah. Six different, six different things that I am aspiring to be, or six different versions of myself, I guess, that I'm aspiring. Now think of inversing this. Think of it this way. Yeah. There is this sort of unlimited set of capabilities that's sitting within you. And these six different roles are just simply your way of trying to transmute that energy out into these different spaces. Mm-hmm. So for me, you know, like the way that I coach people is I'm a challenger type. Um, and now I'm not saying that everyone that's a coach needs to be a challenger type, but with the types of clients and clientele that I have, the types of things that I work with people on, um, you know, some people are coming to me with really big egos because they're a huge CEO, they're an actor in Hollywood, or they're an athlete, whatever the case is. And, you know, I need to be able to crack through that hard exterior of their ego so that I can build trust quickly with them and, um, and actually help them, you know, make a transformation mm-hmm. in whatever way that that is for them. Yeah. Yeah. But is that who I am? No, that's a useful way for me to get results in that particular role, but that's not who I am. I'm not Todd Herman as a challenger personality type. That's not me at all. Like that's just a part of the way that I come out into that field of play. But then when I have the field of play of my family and my kids, I have a new source code of inspiration and that is Mr. Rogers and my dad. Now, when you think of challenger personality type, would you put Mr. Rogers on that spectrum? No, he would be at the opposite end of it. So that's how Mm -hmm. I look at it is like, Mm -hmm. how can I play with the entire spectrum of the human experience? And so, you know, my, my anchoring ideals and attributes is patient, loving, creative, fun, caring. 
in that role. That's how I want to see myself. Mm. And then how can I deliver that? Well, I mean, for any of us that are using someone or something else as a source of inspiration, you study it. Well, so I grew up watching Mr. Rogers and of course grew up with my dad. Mr. Rogers, when he's having a conversation, does he stand up at his five foot nine level height and look down on the kids? No, he always gets down on one knee. So I would practice that, mm. right? And so, and I've had people say, wait, you practice it? And I'm like, yeah, I wanna practice the role of me being a powerful father to my kids. Because do all these things come absolutely naturally? If you only operate naturally in your world, I will be able to poke hole, so many holes in the way that you operate because mm. naturally isn't the most optimal way for most people to develop themselves or see um, what they're made of possibly. Um, because again, at our core, there is no self. There's just a accessing of a whole bunch of traits and qualities. Now, this also ties into something Carl Jung talked about. He's the one who created the idea of archetypes. And he had mapped out 12 different archetypes inside of the human psyche, right? There's one that's the ruler archetype, which is about, you know, developing order amongst, you know, the people that it cares about. It's the king, it's the queen, it's the, you know, the boss type. Now, there's just like any identity or archetype, there's a good side to it. It's sort of like what's it's drawn, what it's drawn towards. And then there's the, the shadow side of it. And so the shadow side of a ruler archetype is someone who then gets overly controlling. That's how you know the ruler side of an archetype or the, not the ruler side, but the shadow side of an archetype is taking over is the negative thing coming out. So like, then there's a jester archetype. There's a warrior archetype. There's an every man or every woman archetype. There's an innocent, there's a lover, there's a magician. And what his frame was that one of the most important pursuits of the human experience is when you know how to access all 12 of these archetypes. And most people get trapped inside of one or two archetypes. Mm -hmm. So I actively try to find ways of playing inside of this massive holistic um, set of archetypes so I can just discover more of myself. And then what that does is it gives me different lenses to be looking at different situations with people, different ways of being in a moment, right? There's times of, because if you're only a jester archetype, hey, that's great when people need a laugh, but when people don't need a laugh, that's when someone ends up saying something that was supposed to be funny in the moment, but it didn't come off that way. Mm -hmm. And that's because mm -hmm. they're trapped inside of just one archetype for themselves. Um, so, you, you, uh, so, I, so I want to, uh, I, I'm dying to ask you to help me create uh, an alter ego in 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 one area of my life, um, but I just can't decide which one because I'm like, on the one hand, I'm like, oh, you know, it'd be great to get Todd to talk me through like how I can channel Tiger Woods on the golf course, or great to sure. get Todd to talk me through like how I can channel Tim Ferriss uh, or Rich Roll as a as a podcast host. Um, but also everything you're saying about being a dad, and you know, so I. I'm a dad, three kids. I'm a coach of multiple baseball teams. So I'd love to kind of talk through one of those with you and just like where you would even start without to, what would be a few like basic steps you would. Well, you would th that's take. going to like, that'd be like the second step. So A is to find the role. Well, when I say the role that you want to develop an alter ego to help inspire you to a new yeah. level is one, another one frame is, What's an area you want to just have more fun in life with? Like it's just yeah, heavy, yeah. it's hard or whatever, because the thing that makes this so effective is that there's an attitude of playfulness at its mm -hmm. core. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I've said this on so many stages around the world. Everybody resonates with it. Every single person has already used an alter ego yeah. We because we do it naturally as kids. There's no sense of identity until around the age of eight for children. Mm. And so mm. they're playing with many roles. That's why they're playing dress up. That's why they're playing um, Superman or superhero, you know, and they're jumping off things. It's, it's the classic, there is no me anyway. And so what, what am I like when I'm wearing this or doing that, and et cetera. So everyone's already done it. So I look at this, my message is more, I'm more awakening in people, something that's already there. So yeah. what's a role that you want to be more playful with? 
That's one way of looking at it. Or what's an area of your life that if you shifted and changed it would make such a big impact on the total quality of your world's existence right now? And I've had many people who on stage, this is in front of billionaires and hundreds of millionaires, like inside of big business groups where um, they came up afterwards and were like, you know, I, I look at these workshops and I always think of it through the lens of like making me better as an executive or a leader or an entrepreneur, but you just yep. broke me because when I tell the story of me as a dad and Mr. Rogers being my source code of inspiration and my own father, yeah, um, they go, that's where I'm under indexing. Yeah. That's where I'm under indexing is there. And so, um, and then the third category is what do you think would actually be the easiest for you as well? So there's some, like it kind of gives you a, a break broad range. Like, you know, if you developed an alter ego for you as a golfer, that might be the easiest one just simply because, um, you know, it's you out there. It's going to only impact you. Yeah. Whereas yeah. some people build up these huge stories of, okay, it's going to be me as a coach or me as a CEO. And, you know, that's good. They, they add a lot more expectation and heaviness mm -hmm. on top of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, those are some interesting filters to look through. I mean, um, the playful one definitely brings the one that comes to mind is, you know, my role as a dad, uh, wanting to be more playful in that role. Um, but the, the one that could have the biggest impact potentially for me, I think is actually the creator one. And so like, if I were to take another step in terms of this podcast, the newsletter, everything associated with this type of content that I'm producing, for me, that would be the one that I think could potentially be most transformational in terms right, so of it could become that. a livelihood, et cetera. Yep. Great. So then it's, what is it about the way that you're currently showing up as a creator that is getting in the way of what you're trying to pursue? goals that you might have or how you'd like to show up your own experience in your day. When you do show up to create something, it's not a good experience for you or like what's getting in the way of that. And a lot of times their attitudes, their character traits, their behavioral traits that might be getting in the way. Uh, I think for me, uh, it's, it may be the fact that, you know, this is kind of like a side project for me and I have a full-time job in finance. And so like, Everything I do creating content in the self-improvement space is more of a side thing. So it, it may get deprioritized um, here mm -hmm. and there. I don't know if that's qualifies okay. as an appropriate answer or not, but. Yeah. Um, but is it, what, what causes it to get deprioritized? You can talk about the semantics, right? Of yeah. just projects getting in the way inside of my normal, you know, thing. Right. Um, yeah. but if someone really, this is where I'm I'd be coaching and I'm tough on it, then is like, if you really cared about what you're trying to do with this yeah. role in your life, you, it wouldn't get deprioritized. Yeah. 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 So there's a surface level. That's a surface level challenge that gets in someone's way they say because it's easy to say well you know like just semantically like you know it's just responsibilities i have and i'm like no i get that but you're yep. the one who just came to me with this desire of wanting x mm -hmm. so are you just bullshitting me like I mean, i'm not challenging you on it just, but hey listen someone, i know you're a lot of people who bullshit. challenging like, so just, i expect challenging yeah they they but people there's a lot of human beings walking around saying that they want something and i'm like no you don't want it yeah like yeah. you're not you're not hungry enough for it, okay? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I play it very black and white with people because I've been at the very pinnacle of sport and working with the elites of the elites of the elites. And there is a huge chasm between them and even great people in their sport. Mm -hmm. And then even the greats in their sports, there's a chasm between people who are in NFL or PGA or whatever. There's chasms, chasms of attitude, mm -hmm. chasms of ritual which kind of comes into, they just have a better story that they're telling themselves about themselves and what they're trying to do out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, there is some sort of other internal resistance around being a creator. One might be mm -hmm. you actually haven't even adopted the identity yet. 
Mm. Mm -hmm. That's possible. That's possible. Um, I don't, it's possible that I'm, I'm like, maybe not, I haven't gone all in on the identity yet. So that's, that's a possibility. Um, and it's a possibility that I think the story I tell myself is that, you know, I mentioned all the identities that I have. I think the story that I tell myself is, Hey, you're balancing a lot of different, or you've got a lot of balls in the air. Right. And so you're trying to do a great job at all of these things. I think what you're saying maybe is some of these really high level performers that you talk to have decided that this thing is so damn important, like nothing is going to get in the yeah. way of this and they yeah. figure it out. Um, and so maybe for me, that's the resistance is just figuring out what just figuring it out, getting that like l absolute laser focus on it and being like, how committed to this am I? If I really am committed and if I really am, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, channeling an identity of a Tim Ferriss or a Rich Roll, guys who have just killed it, right, with their podcast. If you're really serious about that, there's probably a path to getting there. There probably is a path. And it just takes an unbelievable commitment and prioritization. And then all the other tactics that you talk about are downstream from that in terms of, you know, there's an alter ego with a name associated with it. There's yeah. artifact associated with it, et cetera. Am I putting words in your mouth or is that kind of? No, no. Um, so if we were to play this out and then it's, okay, you've already skipped ahead and found source codes of inspiration with Rich Roll and Tim Ferriss. What is it about them that resonates with you? I mean, I, I love, I think they both have an incredible command of the spoken word. I, I'm, I love, I think they both have incredible vocabularies, for instance. I think they both uh, are so just knowledgeable in so many areas that they can have really well-informed conversations with people across a variety of, you know, different areas. Um, that's probably what it is. I mean, I think, I think they're just really skilled conversationalists and I think being worked that, that probably is a function of having many, many, many reps as you were talking about. Yeah. And I think as, I think as they've gotten all those reps, they've established these really fantastic reputations for themselves and followings and that whole world that they've kind of created for themselves, I think is really admirable. So in looking at the attributes and the traits of both of them, one is consistency, right? So you know, at the end of the day, no matter what any of us goes out and tries to do, if there's no ingredient of consistency built into it, you can't be great once a week. Like it's, it's really hard to build a track record of success being great once a week um, yep. at like whatever the craft is, um, you know, whether it's a sport or whether it's, you know, being a great interviewer or conversationalist, like it's just something you're always working at. So the consistency yeah. has to be there. But I know both of them actually pretty well. And you know, one of the things that makes them both really good is their curiosity, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. their inquisitiveness. Um, and then I would say more so with Rich than uh, Tim, R Rich knows himself really well and he is completely fine with having a contentious conversation or mm -hmm. challenging people mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. on a topic when it doesn't maybe map to his worldview. However, because of his curiosity, he's willing for that worldview to be changed. It's actually very self-evident in our interview when I was on his podcast. And, um, you know, Rich was challenged by the idea of alter egos, but his frame was mm. because of authenticity and authentic and being fake mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. 
but he had had so many personal experiences with people like the Iron Cowboy being on his show or David Goggins being on his show, who all mm -hmm. referenced that their mm -hmm. entire success was built around basically identity. Yep. So he had a hard time reconciling his own views and he, he needed me to coach him through like why that was bad or mm -hmm. why it was off or wrong or misguided. And then I got in, we got into conversation around just societal and cultural vernacular. You know, we use these words like you and self and I mm -hmm. as if they're mm -hmm. fact and they are not fact. Mm -hmm. Even the words authentic and authenticity in their root form are actually meant to be applied toward objects, not subjects. Hey, is that an authentic Patagonia vest you have on? Or is that a knockoff? Okay. Mm. Um, human beings are subjective. You even talked about the story about, you know, when you're in biology class, you're one way. And then when you're in chemistry, you're another way or like changing the context of where this body goes, changes how I show up. Of course, I should be different with my kids than I should be when I'm inside of my office or doing an interview. My language changes, my demeanor mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. change, right? And so using the terms authentic self and authenticity in the context of a human being, I mean, it's banned inside of my world. You can't use that inside of my company because human beings are not authentic. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. not objects, we are subjective. And so that's a part of me. And that's one of the reasons why people would be attracted to me is my thoughtfulness about language because so much of what I'm doing, whether it's with an entrepreneur helping them scale their businesses, is really diving into these strings that tie them down or can propel them forward, which is language. That's how human beings create the world is through our use of language. Um, it's been many studies have been done around how people with a larger vocabulary have higher incomes. Why? Because we can use a greater span of words to communicate what it is that we want in the world as well. We can communicate with ourselves better. So, um, you know, that's around, that's going into deep around rich, rich specifically, but yes, you're right. He has a command of language and yeah. Yeah. he's completely willing at any point in time to shed ideas that don't serve him anymore, serve him anymore. So having said all that, if Rich Roll and, and Tim are your alter egos, let's just play it like that, okay? What we want to get to though is, well, what is it about them that resonates within me of more of what I want to bring out there as attributes and traits, right? So curiosity um, and you know whatever three to five adjectives are, verbs even, because those become the... Uh, encapsulated idea of who it is that's meant to be showing up in this creator space. I'm curious. Yeah. So my content is going to be more curious, challenging mm -hmm. things, questioning things, uh, being inquisitive, asking those things. What else is it about them um, as well? They're also showing up with an expertise, right? I mean, that's how, you know, Tim got his start as well. Yeah. And I also like that one thing I like about them is I also feel like they do a really nice job serving their audience, right? So uh, one thing that I would like to do is, is really serve an audience and not. So one of my goals is like with every piece of content that I produce, I don't want to waste anyone's time. Like I want them to listen to the podcast or read a newsletter and feel like, okay, I just got something like tangible, valuable out of that. I think both of those guys do a really nice job, like drawing out for the most part with their, with all of their guests, like drawing out what is the real tangible, you know, points of value. So that to me, that would be, um, important as well, really, um, creating value essentially for, for the end consumer. Yeah. Um, the, but I'm, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. You're already demonstrating these things in even the way that I got on here, like the, the work that went in ahead of time, the document that you sent over. And, you know, mm -hmm. so even your line of questions is about trying to give the listener right now some tangible, right? Because you're getting not many, I've done, you know, hundreds of interviews around alter egos, but there's only been three where people have asked me to build one for them live and mm -hmm. on the call, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so that's an 
element. So you're already demonstrating that. So that isn't the challenge, I don't think. The challenge on the creator side for many people is the actual getting out there and um, marketing or selling themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, now someone could tell me, like Rich could say, well, I never really went out there and sold myself. And I would say, you're full of shit <laughs> because it's not true. I, you did. So I, I actually think I'm probably more comfortable maybe than I even should be like with doing some of that kind of stuff. Um, I actually think for me, the conflict may be that I'm sort of have two, I have my feet in two different places. One is like I said, full-time job and then other is kind of creator. Right. And so I think at some point, if the rubber really met the road for me, it would be mm -hmm. like going full on into creator and being like, this is my livelihood and this is, you know, so, so I don't know. Whether or not you're going to go and do this, I don't know. Yeah. But, um, one of the easiest shifts I can get people to make is yeah. change the name, change mm -hmm. the name because Greg Campion probably mm -hmm. is exactly what you use in the finance world. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Do you produce content for the people that you serve in the finance world? No. Okay. So, I mean, that's not who it's for, but yeah. No, I know. But yeah. the, 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 the easier shift would be to on your social media yep. changing. Now, again, if you've already got at Greg Campion or whatever the case is, then you can leave that, but you can still change the name that's shown to be creator Greg or... Greg the blank, like in the book, I have all these templates for like how you could rename yourself. Yep. It's exactly yep. what Beyonce did with Sasha Fierce, right? So, um, but- I like I that, cannot, I like that idea. I cannot um, give people enough because that helps to bifurcate because you do have two professional worlds right now yep. that are competing in your head like two wolves. And instead, let's just, one's a unicorn and one's a wolf. Now they don't compete anymore because they're a completely different species. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's a great idea. So, so that that kind of, kind of comes back to some of the tactics that you use in the book. So, name is 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 one powerful one. Um, and I was actually thinking about this when I was listening to your audiobook. I was actually thinking about you. You talk about artifacts, and you mentioned Martin Luther King's glasses, and um, there's yeah. a whole host of different examples. But it was kind of funny because, and this is where I, I'm almost having a uh, alter ego uh, crisis. I think at the moment, and trying to figure out who who I am in this. But I think I'm trying to figure out who I am in this creator world. Um, I and and so it's kind of funny. Um, uh, with I didn't even realize it, but I think uh, I've already been playing with like artifacts a little bit. So, um, so for instance, we're we both mentioned up front we have a similar look going into this podcast yeah, yeah, where yeah. we both have similar glasses etc but these glasses these so these glasses i started wearing in the in the world of finance like almost probably like 15 years ago or something and it's yeah. funny they were actually non-prescription glasses when i started wearing them but the reason why i started wearing them at least consciously was because i was having some migraine headaches and there was like an anti-glare pro um, uh, protection in them that allegedly helped with that Consciously, maybe there was something else going on subconsciously that yeah. made me feel like smart or something. Um, but interestingly, uh, I've on this podcast and there's we're recording video uh, as well. But on this podcast, I've kind of alternated, and so a lot of times when I'm not in work, when I'm in like let's say coach mode, there's no glasses. There's often a baseball hat. Okay, yeah. and so I've actually done several podcasts where. I've been in a baseball hat and no glasses and there's a little shift in identity there. So you mentioned, okay, Hey, s change your name or your social handles and stuff for a creator business. I actually think looking at some of the other tactics that you're recommending in the book, I actually think there's maybe even some stuff on the artifact side I could do as well. Well, I mean, yes. So um, I don't wear my glasses around my kids. That's not my uniform. I talk about in the book. Like, so when you talk about totems and artifacts for the, you know, listener who hasn't read the book yet, um, I talk about the power of uniforms. 
Now, one of the things that we've anchored towards inside of all my coaching and training companies is there's a lot of stuff out there in the world. Authenticity, authentic self is, is a good example of, hey, these are wonderful ideas, but they break underneath the weight of the field of play. Okay. That's where I know our company, we're world-class at not inventing stuff that isn't real. Mm. So when I found the alter ego as this common thread weaving amongst the people who are performing at the highest levels, I was like, well, that's interesting. Why is that? Because I did the same thing. So I had a resonance at the whole, I did it to level. And then when I had enough data, people were constantly saying like, wait a second, this is a real thing. I dove into it you know, talking to people about their method and all that stuff. And I built the method out of it. But then I also go to, cause I'm a, I'm very much dedicated towards science and understanding it. Then I go to, well, why does this work so well? Then? And then I find that many people who are trying to help others in the personal development space are trying to flick switches in the head that do not actually lead towards peak performance. So the one that we're talking about wearing something, having uniform actually ties towards a naturally occurring psychological trigger that we all have as human beings called enclosed cognition. I'm not going to go into it. People can go and read it inside the book and why it works so well, but you having a hat that you wear in your interviews or a coach, like, you know, maybe it's there, there's things that are there. That is, you're not inventing anything. I'm not giving you an idea that you need to work at. I'm, that's why for the work that I do, I can get results from people so rapidly. And that's because I'm just flicking a switch that's already embedded inside your head. You're typically running against the switch, which is why you've got some resistance, right? So people not leveraging artifacts or things that you can wear or a uniform are simply making their life harder than it needs to be. Mm. That's it. Like that's just, yeah. that's, and that's one example, not naming yourself properly is another example. Now, does everyone have to go and name themselves? No, I'm just saying, if you wanna be hyper successful at using this as a tool in your toolkit of personal growth, get a name, get a name. Because names in our own way that our brain processes ideas gives it form and function. The, the moment something main, remains Without form and function, has doesn't have a name attached to it yet. We can't work with it. It's it's an ethereal fog. I can't grab it and touch it. The moment we give it a name, boom, it collapses into a molecular form that I can actually work with now. That's why in horror movies, the scariest part of the horror movie is when we can't see the thing that's causing all of the destruction. But the moment we see it, we're like, oh, that's what it is. Here's its weakness. This is how we can work with it. And then what do they do at the end of the movie? The thing gets defeated, right? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. our own demons within are the exact same way. Give it form, give it substance, give it a name, um, which helps to only accelerate the process. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so all, all of this stuff you really talk about eloqu very eloquently um, in the book and you give tons of examples. So I'm going to link to your book. I'm going to link to that um, conversation that uh, you referenced with Rich Roll, which was a really beautiful conversation um, as well. So I want to link to all of that. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, let me just skip ahead to my final question for you, Todd, because we know we got to get you out of here. And that is my standard closing question uh, that I ask all my guests. But um, tell me, what's one thing that you have figured out uh, in life that uh, maybe others might not have yet? Well, we've talked about identity um, being a, a superpower when you know how to play with it. So I'm not going to go over and, and say that one because that would be my standard response to most people. I would say the biggest thing is the power of a written note sent to someone. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I'm known for, at least because I share it, is I've, since I was 22, had the standard practice of every morning starting my morning by ha writing a handwritten letter to someone. Um, mm -hmm. I have a wax seal that I use and with my own like thing. So I drip the wax on and it's just a one pager, but it's always an expression of gratitude and appreciation for something that someone has done. So if yeah. I've read an author's book, I'll send them a, uh, a letter and it doesn't ask for anything. There's no, Hey, whenever you're in New York city, let's get together for coffee. It's just, you know, Hey, Greg, uh, we've never had the pleasure of meeting before, but I just wanted to send you a quick note saying, thank you so much for writing your book. Um, specifically, I got so much out of what you wrote on page number 67. That's yeah. 
something that's important because specificity in compliment yep. is important. And, and then I tell people like how it like shifted something for me. Um, and then I say, you know, like, so in this example, like I know how hard it is to get your words down on paper. Um, but I just want to let you know how much it uh, impacted me and I appreciate it. And, um, I wish you all the best. Todd Herman. I love that. The very bottom of that. my letterhead is, uh, my email address now never used to be when I started this in the late nineties, but. I've sent letters off to like Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan. They, they replied back when they were alive with on wow. presidential letterhead. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Daniel Day Lewis um, all responded, not necessarily in letters, but they responded yeah. in emails to me. Most common response I ever got back from people is, you know, you, you didn't know how much I needed to get this today. Awesome. Um, and so that expression of gratitude, gratitude's important. But I think that it's such a powerful emotion to now pass on to somebody else and not hold it selfishly within myself and let someone know. And so if there is, you know, something that I figured out, it's the power of getting someone a handwritten note. Yeah, that's great. Well, that's a wonderful one to end on. And let me uh, just express my gratitude to you uh, for taking the time to come on this podcast. So your work has really impacted me uh, massively. I can't wait to dive in and think about more. Uh, and I hope our listeners get a lot out of it. Like I said, we'll link to your book, uh, some past interviews, all your socials and everything, but I would recommend everybody immediately go and follow uh, Todd because you're bringing so much value um, every day. So thank you so much for joining me and thanks for everything you do every day. Well, thanks for the invite and it's been uh, a real pleasure. Thanks, Greg. There you have it, folks. Todd Herman. Uh, what a cool guy. I definitely recommend following Todd on social media. I'm going to link to all of his handles uh, in the show notes. So go over there and give him a follow. Uh, and if you want to dive further into this world of alter egos, it's super fascinating. Uh, so I would definitely recommend going to check out his book, The Alter Ego Effect. Like I said, I love the audio book, uh, but you know, the print edition is a great uh, option too. So go check that out. Links uh, to all that in the show notes. Also, just wanted to give special thanks to Todd for coming on. That was a lot of fun uh, having that conversation. Uh, finally, before you go, just a reminder, two things. One, uh, if you want to get the recap to this episode and some thoughts from me every other week covering whatever my latest obsession is from zone two training to alcohol free living, you know it. It's all about habits, uh, routines, motivations, uh, self-improvement, essentially. If you want to get it, one email from me every other week, head over to gregcampion.substack.com and subscribe. I'd love to have you as part of that community. Uh, the link to that is also in the show notes. And finally, one more time, if you liked this episode or the podcast more generally, please help us spread the word. Tell your friends about it or share this episode uh, on social media. That's how people hear about us. So that would be hugely, hugely helpful. Appreciate all of the support. And with that, I will see you next time.